This is Emergency FD Storyline. I started having chest pains and nightmares of things, and things were exaggerated in my mind. And um, I wound up going through a, I guess, counseling and all kinds of things for for post-traumatic stress. I didn't realize this stuff bothered me. And then that's what, I guess, forward made my wheels turn, telling stories and, and really wanting to be kind of real with it. And I want to share those stories and how difficult this job is that it takes a very special person to do that. That's kind of where the podcast Emergency FD Storyline came from. You know his voice, but do you know him? Why would a man with years of experience in radio and television take an interest in the world of firefighting and emergency medical services? What is this thing called Emergency FD and the reason for this podcast, Emergency FD Storyline? The views expressed on this program are from the guests and the host and do not necessarily represent the views of any government agency, private company or public service. Emergency FD Storyline's focus is to tell the stories of those in the fire service and to highlight what matters to our first responders. My name is Danny Sinnott, coming to you from the Brave Enough Studios in the Land Down Under in Geelong, Australia. You might say we're going to turn the tables on the host of Emergency FD Storyline, Tom Mann. He is the creator and producer of this podcast. He's a good mate of mine and co-hosts a podcast with me called Brave Conversations, which can be found at braveenough.org. The Emergency FD Story, that's our storyline. Welcome, Tom, to your own podcast, Emergency FD Storyline. This is a bit of a spin on things because you are the host of this podcast. But of course, when we're telling your story, you can't host yourself. Known to talk to myself, but wouldn't be good. Well, in Australia, we call that the first sign of madness. But you are mad on many things. Your background is in radio and TV. You're not actually a firefighter. Not at all. I've spent... 40 years, I guess, in radio and TV, and about 10 straight of those on the air every day in radio, still doing radio now, which you do radio Mm. as well in Australia. Yeah. And that's my background and worked in television, started producing kind of documentary work and uh, really got in a lot of different things. So how in the world did you marry radio and television broadcast with emergencies and firefighting and jumping on fire trucks? It was late 80s, early 90s, I got really interested in doing something different. I thought, okay, radio, television, it's kind of the, as they call it, you know, theater of the mind, it's radio. (laughs) And I thought, you know, I wanted to get into some really cool stuff. And so I thought I want to do something different. And then the television show came out called Cops. Mm -hmm. And they showed up in Memphis. And I remember I actually followed them around, just want to know how they were doing what they were doing. I was interested in firefighting ever since I was a kid. And I thought, how can I do that? And that's kind of how it started. And I wanted to see if I could capture what they did as a job. I found it to be fascinating. Mm. Fast forward a little bit. I knew a firefighter who I've interviewed. His name was Risa Davis. And Mm -hmm. I grew up with his kids. And I approached Risa. He was recording weekly uh, broadcast because he was the mm. chaplain of the fire department in Memphis and he would come in my studios and record. And one day I just said, listen, how can I record firefighters? How can I do this in video? What have you? And he said, I'm not sure how you can do that, but maybe I can get you in touch with the union president of the mm. fire union in Memphis. He needs to get you in touch with what's called the director. We have a new director who heads up the fire department, in the city of Memphis. He works underneath the mayor. He's a political appointee. That's kind of what I understood about Mm -hmm. it. And he said, it'll take a little while. So anyway, he set me up and I sat down with this fire union president and said, listen, I would like to do this. And he said, well, you need to talk with the new director. His name was Charlie Smith. I said, you need to talk to Charlie. And I said, well, how can I do that? So I got a meeting with this guy. And the next thing I know, I'm in the office telling him, hey, listen, I want to jump on your fire engines (laughs) and ride around. And, you know, there's some other folks that were in the room at the time kind of looking at me like, yeah, kid. Mm-hmm. And I was in my late twenties at that time. He said, you know what? That's an interesting idea. And my goal was to actually do a documentary on the fire department. Mm-hmm. That's how it all began. And the next thing I know I'm signing some releases. And I remember his line to me was, here's the deal. If you do anything to harm my department or anything else, this arrangement's over with. 
you know, this isn't about making us look bad. I hope that's what I understand you want to do is make us look good. I said, yeah, you know, so I was curious and that's how it started. Which is really a phenomenal opportunity for both of you. I mean, you're getting this experience that, you know, you're into fires, you're wanting to sort of see the behind the scenes, which I guess many of us are curious about because we are so appreciative of our frontline workers and our firefighters and our emergency responders. Um, But I can imagine for them too, what a great opportunity to actually train the public in what to do and what not to do and what the consequences of certain actions are in fires starting and in fighting fires and what to do in an emergency. I think that's kind of what got him interested and he was a new he was a a new into the office at the time i remember as we went a little bit further i just got bitten by a bug i showed up went out started writing and started filming and i started testing cameras and how i could do it then i came up with the idea i want to go inside that burning building how can that happen and i had that discussion with him later and he said ah no 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 i don't think you can do that he said i tell you what maybe we can help you you can do some things during training activities or Mm -hmm. what have you. And I went through a series of fire training to learn how to wear the air mask they wear. Every time there was some kind of a training event going on with the city of Memphis or any department within the area, I would show up and I would go inside of that building or that, that house or whatever it was. I learned how to wear an air mask and went through that multiple times. It became second nature to me. The other thing was I had been a competitive swimmer I didn't mind being inside of this mask and that didn't bother me at all. In fact, it was, to me, it was like swimming, what my mentality was about it, but that's kind of how it progressed forward. And what, what I got into was I really started this concept of wanting to tell their story. Mm -hmm. That's what came out of it. It wasn't so much of a thrill that that was in the beginning, but then I began seeing the seriousness of it. And I think the first time when there were two firefighters that died, Um, that kind of messed with Mm -hmm. me. I'm like, I would like people to know what these guys do. So that's what got in the idea of storytelling, but they did so much. I'm like, how can I put this in a package and then developing the equipment? Like, what can you use? And Mm -hmm. I took cameras they were using in the first Gulf war using different formats and trying to figure out how to do, but I was wearing, I mean, I had to carry these very large cameras. I mean, they were heavy, yeah, heavy belts for lights, uh, these wireless microphones and things. And I had to learn how to do that. So I spent probably about two years figuring out how, how figuring out how to shoot what they did. And I rode with firefighters and I also rode with paramedics. And so I kind of got the emergency medical side of things and then the firefighting side of things. And they just keep, kept growing from there. So here you are, jumping on fire trucks, <laughs> swanning around with firefighters and paramedics. You're wanting to tell their stories, but I would imagine on some of those jobs, their stories also became your story. Because I'd imagine there would have been some pretty intense situations that you were part of. Does anything in particular come to mind? Any particular situation? I very quickly found myself in some situations that I didn't tell a lot of people. I got shot at, different things like that would happen. You'd go to some kind of domestic violence call. They were pretty intense. Different things would happen. I remember the first event where I saw someone who had literally burned to death. I got on the scene and there was a gentleman, an older gentleman. He was in a room, he was in a wheelchair and the room caught on fire because of a space heater, got there almost the same time the firefighters did. And I was filming the firefighters putting it out and I heard them yelling, there's, there's a man in there, there's a man in there. They finally got the fire knocked down. One of the investigators let me walk in and I walked inside and I'd never seen a body or someone burn really bad. I walked in and he said, you could take some video, what have you, just, you know, this can't go on the air. And that was my arrangement, couldn't go hmm. on the air without any approval. And I walked in there and all of a sudden there was um, a wheelchair, but I couldn't recognize it was a human being. I thought there was a basketball sitting on top of something and Mm. that was the man's head. And it was really shocking. And then I remember the smell. I remember everything else with it. That was the first time. And then, then fast forward, I went to another fire, young boys died. The older brother was laying on top of the younger brother, protecting him from the flames, and they both succumbed to Mm. uh, mainly smoke, but the older brother had been burned, and I went into the room and saw that. So I started seeing that, the reality, but what what did change, you're talking about, I became part of the story, is I began understanding 
what that job was about, the things that, you know, most Mm. of us who are not in the fire service, we don't see these things on a daily basis. And I began seeing people that had been killed by gunshots and stabbings, all kinds of things. You, You see that kind of violent side of it. And then you saw the amazing things they did, but you saw how that took a toll. And I remember getting numb with it. I got where I could pretty much see anything and I got used to it. And a couple of years later, there were two more firefighters that died. And I had known those firefighters. Hmm. And I went to that scene. I remember capturing one of them being brought down. This was a very big fire called 750 Adams, where um, Larry Mathis and a guy named Billy Bridges died. That one really kind of hit home with me. And kind of I began changing because I got asked to film part of the investigation and all that. And so I became very much involved in it. Mm -hmm. Then from that point on, I began producing and putting together stories for fire and emergency television networks around the country. And so I started doing some network uh, work for television, all these things just kind of kept evolving. So my project as a documentary kind of went to the side. I wound up developing training and working with these networks, just like, what can I do to help? And that's mm-hmm. what I got into. And that's kind of where that went from there. So how did that change your mindset, Tom, on you know how you moved forward from that point? Because, I mean, you're dealing with really some pretty traumatic imagery there. You're all of a sudden you know, got relationships with people personally that are passing away. You then have, I guess, the professional side of things going on. How did all of that kind of marry together? And how did that kind of influence the direction that you wanted to take that and the importance and the vitalness of this podcast? It was kind of learning the reality of the job. And I got to know these firefighters in the city of Memphis very close. Then some of the little suburbs outside of Memphis, like Bartlett, where I was living, and Germantown, Carville, these other towns around the area, I got very close with the firefighters. And I would go out and pretty much I could go on any scene, tape anything. And I guess they they kind of trusted me at that point because mm-hmm. I wouldn't take something and put it on the air. And there's some things that I taped I couldn't even show. I mean, there's just mm. horrible things, you know, I, captured somebody burning to death on an interstate in a car fire and they couldn't get it out. It was, it was the worst thing I think I ever saw. So you're standing there while this man's burning. Obviously the firefighters, the paramedics are attending to that, but how did you feel in that moment being behind the camera, not being able to do anything? Did you feel like, man, I should be dropping this camera and trying to help out? No. Like, Yeah, I could help out, but there's nothing I could do. There's a thing, concept I've come to understand now, concept of survivor's guilt. You you feel mm-hmm. guilty. I can remember on that incident, I really, well, I, I saw what was going on and I, I was, there was this guy there and he had been burned to death, had no face, no anything. His body had literally melted into the springs of the car. It was so bad and he was still alive and breathing. I remember saying something, I can't get this, I can't do this. And I remember a, a gentleman he was a paramedic supervisor, walked up to me and he said, keep the camera rolling. I'm like, what? And he said the word training, training. I captured this event and it wound up going all over the country to fire departments on how to deal with that. And I remember that's opened my mind that Mm. what I could do could benefit the firefighters. I didn't want to capture things like that. That's, Mm. you know, you get into it and it's, I mean, it's it's extremely sensitive stuff, isn't it? It's very, but I started looking at it. If this will help someone, that will make the difference. And I had a widow of a firefighter, one of the ones that died, told me she was watching this footage next to me of her husband being brought down. Mm. They're doing chest compressions on him and everything. She said something to me that really also it struck me this time. She said, with all those working on my husband, which was Larry Mathis, if he, if he was supposed to make it, he would have said this was his time. This was his time. I have faith and belief that I know who Larry is and I know who God is and this is okay. She looked at me and she said, if this can help anyone, please let them see it. And that that also struck me too. I've had a couple of those events. The hard part of it was you become one of them. And mm-hmm. I really felt like I was one of them. I watched a documentary on a uh, a man who was a 
war correspondent. He filmed during the Vietnam War, and he was embedded with troops, American troops in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And he was telling all these stories about things that he had experienced and being in firefights and all these things. But he said, you know, I wasn't one of them. I wasn't, Mm -hmm. you know, I was a member of the press, but he said, I became one of them. It's like you become this part of this band of brothers, experienced everything they did their emotions. And that is the one thing that I think happened to me is I began to experience and having deep Mm. conversations with these men and women that I worked with. And that changed everything for me. On the practical side of that, I actually came up with this title called Emergency FD. That's part of the story. It was kind of emergency fire department, but I actually started working on little concepts and using that phrase, that, Mm. that word, that brand. It just kept kind of growing that's kind of where where it was at this point it was difficult it was difficult to to do some of those things you're listening to emergency fd storyline we'll continue my conversation with my guest tom mann i want to take a moment to remind you that you can help the continued production of emergency fd storyline audio podcast by donating any amount at our website emergencyfd.com Look for the donate page on our website. Any amount will make a difference. Now back to the emergency FD story. You know, just hearing all of those, you know, I guess roles that you've had and and the relationships that you've had, not just with even the emergency workers, but their families, to bring a podcast like this to them for emergency workers in training, for those on the job needing something to connect with and relate to, to maybe feel like they're not alone or that they're able to relate in some way, maybe even partners of emergency workers to get a little bit of an insight into what their partners are facing. And maybe emergency workers, I can imagine perhaps like war heroes coming back with PTSD, being able to understand a little bit more how to support in that space. I think this is something very, very special that you have here with this podcast. In a few minutes, I'll get into exactly how the podcast started, but maybe back up just a little bit with this. I started experiencing the post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand it at the time. I I stopped doing what I was doing because I had, there was a couple of events that I was just like, I can't take this anymore. I'd been in New York City more than once, rode with uh, New York City firefighters. That was an event. But then 9-11 hit. And about that time, I just, I got where I couldn't really take what I was seeing anymore. It was bothering me. Mm -hmm. Some other events happened in my life. And then 10 years after that, I started having chest pains and nightmares of things and things were exaggerated in my mind. I wound up going through a a pretty big, I guess, counseling and all kinds of things for for post-traumatic stress. I didn't realize Mm -hmm. this stuff bothered me. Because I never touched anything. I would say I didn't touch anything. I didn't do anything. I had a camera. Yeah. But I started experiencing that. And then that's what, I guess, forward made my wheels turn, telling stories and really wanting to be kind of real with it. But I also wanted to make it where someone, if they weren't a firefighter, they could listen to it, but to understand really what's going on. And I want to share those stories and how difficult this job is that it takes a very special person to do that. That's kind of where the podcast Emergency FD Storyline came from. And actually, i got to credit two people with that. <laughs> One of them is you, because you contacted me a couple of years ago and said, hey, I need a voice to voice over the intros and outros of my podcast, yeah. and which grew from there. And that's the first time, to be honest with you, you said the word podcast, and the first thing in my head, well, I don't even know what a podcast really is. I, <laughs> I did. I knew what radio was. I knew what a radio show. Wow. So I didn't know that. that, that yeah, oh, yeah. So, I mean, when I heard that, I'm like, then I started thinking, okay, a podcast. Oh, it's like a talk radio show thing, you know, and I, you know, I had no idea. But that's what I thought, you know, maybe I could do something with that. That went through my head. And then my son, which is another part of the story, a firefighter now in Memphis in special operations, started telling me, Dad, you need to take some of that old stuff you have and do something with it. And he mentioned how important some of those things were. He used to watch them and learned a lot of stuff from the stories and things that I shot back in the day. And then COVID hit and all these other things. And I actually thought, well, you know, I can get these firefighters. Sometimes they don't want to get on camera. Sometimes they do, but most of the times they don't. These guys 
men and women, you look at their eyes and they start tears well up with things Mm. they talk about. It's very emotional, very deep. And I thought maybe I can do, let me do the thing I used to do in radio. That's kind of how it began. And it began in uh, January of 2020. And I literally went in Memphis where I was from and I called up Charlie Smith, who was this director that I, that got me going years ago. He was the first one and he showed up at a hotel room and I recorded him. And it's one of the first podcasts that I did. Yeah. Uh, two other people, another gentleman and Todd Conklin, who uh, was part of this really traumatic experience we had with a fellow burning to death, interviewed him. And then also now the current fire director, Gina Sweat. And to be honest with you, I just interviewed people and I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it. And then COVID hit and then, okay. Um, some extra time was, on your hands. Yeah. I uh, went out releasing it about three months later, and that's how we began. And I started talking about COVID because I mean, that was a big deal for fire services around the country and, and around the world, even where you are. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how it began, the actual podcast. Yeah, I didn't know the role I'd played in that, but I'm glad I did because, <laughs> you know, what an incredible gift this podcast is to so many people. And, you know, I'm super excited to see where it goes because – you know, you've had some really incredible stories to date. No doubt there will continue to be more. And there's one thing that you've talked about in the organization you're a part of mm-hmm. is that you have a phrase says every story matters. Yeah. And that's true even in this area. Mm-hmm. And the point is that every story matters yeah. of their lives because it teaches. The other thing I'm finding, the older guys are telling something to the younger guys. Just the other day, you know, something that really hit me again that I'm very concerned about when it comes to the fire service, uh, another firefighter, female firefighter committed suicide. And that was really difficult because my son, several years ago, when I was starting this, he called me one night and he said, dad, he said, this is number five. And I said, what are you talking about? Number five. He said, I've known five individuals or worked with five individuals that have committed suicide that are firefighters. Oh and I'm like, and my, my son at that, you know, he wasn't even, I guess at the time he was about 28. There've been more since then. Those are some of the things that, you know, I hope to do with this, this podcast is to help those in the fire service, EMS. I mean, even your police officers and others, mm-hmm. it's, it's a very difficult line of work. You know, it's okay to get help. Mm-hmm. And everyone, by the way, experiences some kind of post-traumatic stress. The difference between that and the disorder, as some of, you know, we've talked, I've talked to many people about, there's a very big difference, but the effects of that is, is very difficult on individuals in this line of work. Yeah. And some folks do fine, but I know some people that did fine when they were working and then they were tired and they say Mm. the memories and things come back like a storm and I can't sleep. I can't do anything. It never bothered me when I was on the job. It's yeah. like the high of the job. And I really running that. on all of the adrenaline and, and cortisol yeah. for so long. Um, like you, Tom, stopping. And yeah. then it's when it happens. I also have su- struggled with um, post traumatic stress disorder from, you know, some life experiences. And, yeah. and it's, you know, it's awful. It's a horrible thing to have to deal with and to go through. Um, you know, it's not, not an easy fix, but it is definitely treatable. You know, it's one of those things that you have to kind of be brave enough to feel the fear and do it anyway to, you know, you cannot conquer what you will not confront kind of stuff. But I think you're right. I think it does come back to that whole concept of the fact that everybody has a story, that your story matters. And the whole purpose of that is to help each other emerge stronger so that we can then go and help the next person up. And, you know, the fact that you're able to do that through a podcast, through something that really across the world uh, is relevant and helpful. You know, what are, what are ways that you see that people could get behind this and support so that you can continue to support the fire departments and the emergency departments? And to be honest, it takes money. It's funded one way, me, myself, and I. That's really a motive. I've had a couple of people yeah. come on board and, um, and help me, which has been great, underwriting some expenses. Mm-hmm. And that is the big thing that can make a big difference because I want to do more. I want to get into where I talk to family members. They're, mm-hmm. they're 
a husband, a wife, someone who's died talking to them about these tough mm-hmm. issues. But I want to see that expand. And part of it is is producing more of them, mm-hmm. uh, get a little more remote, move further out in different areas with different groups. Sometimes it can be a lighter subject. There's really nothing in what I'm doing that's not appropriate for my podcast. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be a heavy subject. That's okay. It's all about the world of firefighters and telling their stories in different ways. Mm -hmm. Sometimes their stories may be a challenge that's going on in the fire service. And I talked to somebody about that. It's not necessarily um, this horrible thing happened and I'm going to tell you about it. It can be about something even lighter. One podcast I want to do someday is about the humor in the firehouse. That sounds good. It's very light, (laughs) but there's a big, I, I find it to be very lethargic. It's therapeutic. Firefighters sometimes, as they say, have some of the worst humor and yet some of the funniest things that I've ever heard in my life come out of these individuals, men and women. Yeah. And sometimes I call it the most inappropriate things they say at the, at the most big times. You can, it can be the, one of the worst situations and somebody cracks a joke and it is, yeah. it's awful, but it gets you laughing and it diffuses the situation. So there's all kinds of things that you know, I kind of want to get into and talk about, you well, know. Well, you know the puns with firefighters being hot and that yeah. little calendars they produce, well, they do here in Australia for some oh, uh, big funding. I've got a friend actually who's modelled in one of those. We both know him. <laughs> That's right, David Moore. So, yes, and uh, we're going to get him on here soon too. So he's, uh, no, there's so many things like that that's part of their world. I do want to make the podcast uh, more available to the average individual and make it a little, I guess, bring people into the world of firefighting. Mm-hmm. They have their own language and they talk their own language. And sometimes it's, you know, trying to communicate that, but uh, do want to expand it quite a bit. And that does take support, you know, getting that just a little bit, because I'm one that sometimes I've never really want to ask for help, but on our website, there's a, you know, as, as we mentioned and things, there's, a way to donate. And that's really to help fund the production. I'm mm. trying to do that. Eventually, we hope to get some sponsors and things that come alongside and underwrite what we're doing. Yeah, that's right, Tom. And, you know, so easy to see the quality of your work and the help that it's bringing people uh, with emergencyfd.com. So head on over there um, and check it out. And if you'd like to support, I would uh, strongly encourage you to do so because uh, the work that Tom's doing is absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, people may not be in a financial position necessarily, but hey, share the podcasts on social media, pass them on to people that you think may benefit because that helps Tom too. I really encourage anyone listening, share it. You can find it. The big thing, we got it on every podcast directory outlet out there. So we're on Apple, we're on Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon, Alexa, um, the list goes on. So it's, it's, you can find it just about everywhere and we want folks to subscribe and mm. increase the numbers. That's, that's a really big deal for when you're podcasting. It's like anything else. You need the numbers and the people to deliver more and do more. Mm. So that's what we're hoping to do. That's yeah. the practical business side of it. The question ticking in my mind and funnily enough, you and I've never had this conversation, but you know, how do you see that progressing into the future? I'm working on some projects in video there's two directions I want to go. I want to produce some things that directly benefit firefighters and uh, deal with some issues like post-traumatic stress and, and really difficult stories and tell those through video. I'm looking at ways to do that. The second thing that I'm really working on right now is really my first thing is developing a series of almost video, like a video, almost like a television series that is really for non-firefighters to mm-hmm. tell what their job is and you get to see it and experience it and going back, explaining a history, all kinds of things. So I'm working on some, some really interesting projects right now. And I'm going back to my roots of telling stories and documentaries and, Mm. and I'm going back now and, and really I'm telling the story. So it's okay. I've experienced this. I've been working with fire, the fire service now for 30 something years, have an intimate knowledge of it. I'm trying to now shift where I'm telling the story uh, kind of from my perspective of their stories. Mm. So I'm working that. 
you know, the one thing I am good at is talking and using my voice. So that's yeah. what we're going to work a little bit more on that. You've gone from telling the story from the outside in now to telling it from the inside out. Well, Tom, thank you for being a guest on your own podcast today. It's been incredible <laughs> being able to share that with you. Uh, certainly an honour for me being able to step into this uh, space uh, for this particular episode. And uh, blessings to you, my friend. Uh, keep on keeping on because uh, you're really on to something very, very important and very special for a lot of people. Thank you, Danny. And thank you for uh, sharing that incredible sound of your voice. Love the Aussie thing. Nothing like a bit of Aussie, you say. If you would like to contact Emergency FD Storyline with comments or to suggest a story or subject for an upcoming podcast, email us, storyline at emergencyfd.com. That's storyline, emergencyfd.com. Also, check our website at emergencyfd.com. That's emergencyfd.com. You can find us on Facebook. Look for Emergency FD. I'm Danny Sinnott for Tom Mann, and I want to thank you for listening. There are many more stories coming on Emergency FD Storyline. Join us.